Welcome to the Nobody Guide to Life, where we provide tips and tools for personal growth, personal development, and your spiritual journey that you can use right now in your everyday life. I'm J.A. Plosker. You can always find out more at the thenobodyguidetolife.com. Thank you for joining us. So many things in life, different but related. So look at siblings. They're not exactly alike, but if you get to know them, often you can, you can just tell they're from the same family. We're probably familiar with that example, but what about when it comes to holidays? So take, for example, Passover and Easter. Two different holidays from two different traditions, but different doesn't mean unrelated. In fact, according to today's guest, these two holidays are part of a rich narrative throughout biblical history, a narrative that he tells in the hopes that readers will have a deeper understanding of both celebrations to sharpen their view of redemption. Nathan Slagers has been an educator and scholar for almost two decades with 30 published technical papers. He's currently a professor of engineering at George Fox University. And Nathan's most recent book, Passover, the story of Easter from the beginning, rediscovers the meaning behind both Passover and Easter by investigating the history and community behind both events. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, this is fantastic. You know, I, I saw your work and was just really fascinated by it, about this constructing this narrative or revealing, I guess, this narrative about how these two traditions are related. And before we get to that, your background's interesting. You're, you're a professor of engineering, but you, you're writing on Passover and Easter traditions. So tell us about your spiritual journey. How did you come to your spiritual path and what led you to write this, write this narrative? Well, I, I think part of it, my background as an engineering professor was, was kind of key to this. You right. know, I come from a Christian tradition. So the idea of celebrating Easter, very familiar, you know, the, the stories of Passover, you know, in the old Testament are also pretty familiar. And when I was looking at this, at this as an engineering professor, when I teach classes, you know, we're doing teaching some basic principles. You have to understand the why behind it. Right. And you're going to apply those to your engineering problems. And at some point, it was about five years ago, the, you know, the question came up to me, you know, when I was looking at Easter and Passover is, you know, why do we do Easter the way we do? Right. You know, what is its importance? And, you know, where does it come from? What's the story behind it? And there's that obvious connection that, you know, if you're familiar with Easter, you know, that whole scenario, you know, the death and resurrection of Jesus really occurs during Passover holiday. Right. And, and as Christians, you know, we, we've all familiar with that, but we always think of Passover as a, a Jewish holiday. And there is that that story that kind of threads itself through those two holidays. And I think for me, that was kind of the importance is, you know, I want to understand more of why behind it and not just what are the liturgical details of why we do Easter and how it happens. You know, there's so many things that you could have put your analytical mind to. Um, and, you know, these traditions are so broad, Judaism, Christianity, there's so much there that's rich and open for, for revelation and discussion. But why these two holidays for you? What was it about those two holidays that really drew you, I guess, spiritually or even academically into that study? Why were you so drawn to that? Well, I think when I started investigating it, there were some obvious connections. Right. And I think to me, like no one had ever explained that to me. A lot of times we'll have specific details or like 30, 30 minute sermons is kind of common on a specific topic. And a lot of right. times there they would talk about one thing or another and not necessarily connected. And when I went back to it, the, the first strategy I did was let, let's just find all occurrences of, you know, the Passover through right. Judaism and Christianity. And once I started taking those different stories and looking at them more with a perspective of how do they connect right. all of a sudden, you know, the, the purpose behind all of them seemed to kind of align. He, mm. And I saw this, this one story behind all of them. And it wasn't just distinct events that were separate. They were all connected. Wow. So, okay. So talk to us then about these traditions. How are they related? Cause I think, some people have heard, like you said, these 30 minute sermons. I think a lot of people may have heard that they, they sort there's this influence that these narratives sort of occurred with each other, as you said, that these events occurred during the Passover season. But tell us a little bit about 
how these traditions are related. Okay, so I mean, let's go back to you know, even you know that that last Passover, you know, you know, in Jerusalem when Jesus was going to be essentially crucified, and then the resurrection after that. So clearly, that was a, a Passover. And there's always this phrase that's used, the Lamb of God. Right. You know, as far as, you know, in Christianese, that, that makes sense. But, you know, what does that really mean? And you can go all the way back to that, that first Passover in Exodus, where they're sacrificing a lamb, you right. know, as they're going to, you know, be leaving Egypt and enter into the promised land of, after a journey. So those two are kind of obvious connections just in terms of names. Right. But as we go through that the idea of a Passover, the Passover events continue. So one of the next times we hear of Passover in the Old Testament is after the Israelites had wandered for 40 years in the desert, and then they cross into the promised land. Right. The first thing they do is they celebrate a Passover. Okay, right. And, and there's, there's obviously these links within the story that when they left Egypt, they had to cross through a Red Sea. Hmm. When they left the desert, went into the promised land, they also, there's another event where they, they crossed over the Jordan River and it also was separated. So you get some very similar connections in these events. And even as we go further on and we move towards the New Testament, there's stories such as the book of Ruth. Hmm. The, the Passover never really comes up in name. The word's not there. Right. But even the holiday, the, the times and the seasons match up. It's implied this always happened during the barley harvest. It was the first month of their year that this happened. And this is right. the same time Ruth would leave Moab and go through that. She went this exact same path that the Israelites did as they entered into the promised land. So if you're familiar with those little aspects, you look at the book of Ruth and even though Passover doesn't come up, it's a Passover story. Right. And each of these stories adds to what is the purpose of the Passover, which is really just a redemption story. Right. And each one adds what I like to say, an extra layer of the meaning and the story. So how do these Hebrew Testament ideas, how do they relate then to the things going on in the New Testament? So what is that, what is that hearkening back from the time of Jesus and maybe around that Last Supper to these events in the Hebrew Testaments? What does that look like from your research? What are the connections there? Well, it's, it's really, I think, this, this long story of, even if you just look at it from a liter literary perspective right you know a lot of time you have this idea what is redemption when we think of the exodus like the israelites were redeemed from slavery right and, that, and there's that key word and as we move through each of those different events there's this extra layer of redemption that's explained like what is the purpose you know if you're a slave and you're redeemed from your your slave master and you leave that is a, definitely a good thing <laughs> But, but what's the point of that? Like if, you, if you were just a slave, you have nothing, and you're dropped off at the edge of, the, right. you know, of where you're at and said, well, now you're free to do whatever you want. But if you don't have any money or resources, that turns out to be not as great of a blessing as you would think. Right, right. Interesting. And there's really a purpose behind that. And we just kind of look through these strategies. Once we get to, say, Joshua, it's not so much about being redeemed from slavery but you're brought into this promised land that promised land itself has its own purpose that now you are you have your own comfort you have your own safety within that right and as we get to ruth the next layer is it's not just about comfort it's really about a rest Interesting. so we you think about being you know what does rest really achieve it's not so much a state of laziness mm -hmm. as much as it is security and we get that extra layer of rest and security added to it. Right. And that's really by the time we get to this, the New Testament, that Passover, and which culminates in Easter, is that's really kind of the fulfillment of this long story of redemption where over the centuries it's been further explained and clarified mm -hmm. what the actual purpose of redemption is. Okay, so can you talk to us a little bit about that and then draw that draw that connection then to that time of the Last Supper using that motif? That's interesting. Because if you actually look at the Last Supper, there's a long speech in the book of John where Jesus himself is kind of clarifying what is new. Okay. And, and I think this is really the new part. I mean, the idea behind Christianity is you, you know, there's this redemption and the salvation. 
the whole purpose of that is what Jesus was explaining at this, at this last Passover and fulfilled through Easter is you're brought into a rest that was fulfilled through someone else's work. Hmm. I think when you look back at the, the old Testament, it's really, it's, it's very law based. You're given a long list of rules, right? If you break the rules. You have to essentially form, you know, re some redemption for yourself through these sacrifices. And that right. went on forever. And that's not a very restful state. So you've right. basically been redeemed, but now you're stuck in this, this process of, fulfilling this law. And I think once we get to the Old Testament, you start seeing the idea behind this first Passover really fulfilled, is okay. that it's this elimination of this continual work of following these rules and that final Lamb of God, the word that's used quite often in the New Testament, is the one that kind of fulfills that once and for all. And you, and you say, and all of a sudden we get to the end, like this is the purpose of redemption. Hmm. It's trying to bring you into this this rest or this completed state of security, which does require you to continually be doing these sacrifices year after year to cover your own shortcomings. Okay. So in, then in your point of view, then from your research, the underlying theme of, of this, the underlying connection here is that this last supper, what Jesus is talking about is sort of the, the end of the long road of redemption that, he's now explaining that you can now rest completely in, in your redemption because the work has been done. Yes. And I, and I think that is kind of the premise of Christianity, but I think that's what I found interesting about the stories. I had never really thought about that way. You know, when you come to, you know, a lot of times when we're looking about religion, you know, starts off where a lot of times you get your view of religion from your family. Right. Kind of where you start. And at some point when you become, you know, an adult, a lot of times I would go through and question like, well, why am I believing this? Why am I doing this? And I wanted to go back through and trace the, the why behind everything. I, I knew how, I knew what, I knew all the steps. Right. But it was remarkable to me when I went back and looked through, out through the story from all the way from the beginning, knowing where, where it ended. And you go back and look at that first exodus and you start seeing that there's this long journey of, of revelation, if you will, of how we start with a very simple redemption. There's promises of it being completed. And then over the centuries, these extra layers or clarifications are shown until it's culminated at the end. Interesting. So your process then was really, like you said, piecing together in a very systematic way through research, piecing this story together. So it seems to really have a distinct beginning and in some ways a distinct ending, even though humanity is the ongoing project of revelation at least for these two holidays you've created this this story arc with a beginning and an end that's very interesting where have you found how have you found this to be accepted like do you, i'm sure you talk about this i'm sure you speak on this how has this been received in the communities where you're speaking on it i mean it really depends on the community within the christian community i think there's you know pretty favorable because i feel like what they're doing is they have that same perspective I had a lot of times we haven't pieced this together right we we've taken some of these events like oh there's a Passover in you know in Exodus and that's loosely connected to what we consider Easter and most right. people will accept that as is I think for me once you see this whole story the the one phrase I use is restoring the joy of your salvation that's from one of the psalms okay and i feel like sometimes we get so familiar with things we we've known the facts for so long you just take them for granted you don't right. necessarily understand the why behind it or even the significance right and, and a lot of people that you know within the christian community they go back and they look at the story and most of them will say about half or maybe even three quarters of the information I gave them, they already knew. Right. They just never had it strung together and shown how that actually established the importance of the process, how they have a better understanding of what Easter is and what its implication and its meaning is once you see the whole story laid out. Interesting. You know, Nathan, that really makes me think about uh, the path of personal and spiritual growth in general, about we wake up in the morning and maybe we have a habit 
of meditation or a habit of prayer. And maybe it comes to a point where we don't even really think about what we're doing anymore. We just have these facts that we do through the day, but we lose sight of the, the vibrancy of it, the story, how it links our life together. And so when I hear you talk about how people receive what you've presented, it's very interesting because when you give people research and a beginning and an ending, you can help bring stories alive, even stories people have known. You can make them come alive again. So that's, that's very interesting. And it, it reminds me of something that I heard you say and that you've actually alluded to in this conversation. Now, you say the why behind our traditions is more important than the what. So what, is, what does that mean to you? What, 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 are you what, what, is that, what is the theme there? What are you trying to say to us there? Okay, so that actually, there, there's a TED Talk that was given by Simon Sinek back in 2009. He, he titled it, Why? Right. So to give you a little background, because this terminology came from what I, I saw him saying. His was more on leadership. Right. But he starts off with this three concentric circles. In the very center, there's a question of why. The next circle out, there's a question of how. And on the very edge, the very first question is what. Okay. And he talks about leadership and business, but I think even in terms of spirituality, this is very important. We're so familiar with the what. You know, right. if I look at Christianity or even different religions, if I was Judaism or uh, Buddhism or any other religion, we know some of the what it is. Maybe we could define it. You could also talk about the specific beliefs and rituals that would go along with that. Sure. And a lot of times we get to that surface level, like the what is really not that important. Right. Like, why do we do the certain things? Well, you go back in one level further, it's the how. Hmm. Those are even more specifics about our our liturgy, some of the, the rules, if you will. Right. But the most important part is the why. Right. If we're going to look at different religions, different views of spirituality, really looking at their, you know, what they do on the surface is not really the most important thing. It's like, what are their reasons behind that? Like if we're going to celebrate Easter, like I know what Easter is. I know how I celebrate Easter, but why am I going to do that? Right. Or if, you know, a believer of Islam, why do you pray a certain time, many times a day, certain directions? I mean, those are just the rules. If you're really going to evaluate and look at it for yourself, you should get further in and say, why do we do these? What is the purpose? What is the reason behind them? And I think that's a great way of looking at spirituality. If you can get down to that fundamental level, that's really the important question. I love that. You know, Nathan, how has that worked in your own life? As you, because you, you're now so intimately tied to these stories, these narratives. So, for you and your own spirituality, how has that, how has that why versus what sort of framework? How has that shown up in your own life? How has that sort of reinvigorated your beliefs and your spirituality? I mean, it really gives me gives me more confidence, gives me more mm. peace because I, I think right. that, that is. It, there always comes a point someone will question you like why do you do this right and that's kind of an unnerving question if you haven't really thought about it it's not <laughs> right. a very it's not a very good answer just to say well i always did this since i was a kid now i do it and so this is why i believe this right and i, I think at some point that question came up and i didn't have a great answer right and i think going back through it was like i see this you know for me when i look at this connection between Passover, Christianity, and my, my spiritual view is to me is like, I have now connected the dots. I understand right. why I'm doing this. If someone asks me why I have a better reason right. and I would really like to see, I mean, I would like to see a book from even other authors with different religious backgrounds of saying like their, their kind of journey. I would be interested to see, you know, someone who is a follower of Islam. What is their connection? What's their journey? What is that process? Mm, I love that. I think we could, for any different religion, I think there's almost an equivalent book that could be written right. for someone that knows those details. I mean, it couldn't be me because I don't know those traditions as well, but someone else probably does. And I would almost encourage anybody, even if you're not from a Christian background or if you know someone who was or is, is, you know, take a look at this and kind of see this is essentially my description of why I think Christians connect the Passover and Easter and their reason behind their belief system. doesn't mean you have right. to agree with it, but that this is essentially kind of our story. And it'd be interesting right. to compare other 
spiritual tradition stories too and kind of look at them from this big picture. I love that because, you know, it is true what you say. We, we, do, we do tend to just go along in our day. And like you said, if someone were to come, someone were to come up to us at a house of worship and say, because we could answer the question very easily. What are you doing? Oh, communion. What are you doing? Oh, lighting a menorah. Well, if they were to take that next step, as you say, and say, well, why are you doing that? A lot of us would have a moment for pause. And, you know, I would encourage listeners to think about the why, as you say, the why behind our spiritual practices. You know, why did you, why did you start trying to manifest something in the first place? Why did you start praying in the morning? Why did you start meditating? So you take something that you do every day, something that had tremendous meaning to you, and revisit that practice and really sit down with yourself and ask yourself why you show up for that practice during the day. I think that's, I think that's, that's a fantastic point of view, Nathan, and I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought that up. And, and it sort of leads me to this question. If we start to understand the whys behind our traditions, I mean, do you think that this new understanding of Passover and Easter can build bridges between faiths? Because it sort of piggybacks on, on the statement you just made, how you'd like to see people from other traditions write these books. Do you think that these new understandings can build bridges between faiths? Because I think sometimes people think it's a competition. Well, you can see clearly what Nathan said about the end of the story, but I'm not sure that's all there is here. Have you thought about how these kinds of understandings can help people of different faiths understand each other better? Yeah, absolutely. A good way of looking at this, understanding the why, I think it diffuses some bad situations. Sure. I, I've seen this very common with, you know, people of different religions, especially if you get in a group of people that are, from, are similar to you and right. you're talking about a different religion, it's very easy to disparage the other ones. Yes. Like you, you'll look at one of these very specific, like liturgical things they do. And you just, you almost will not maybe mock them in a sense like, oh, they just do this weird ritual. Of right. Course that does, of course, that doesn't do anything. What's right. the, that's silly. And you could do that for any religion. Right. And, and I think that that's because you don't really understand the why. You're looking at some details of, you know, we, you know, you have unleavened bread and this grape juice that we drink on first Sunday of every month or something. And people will be like, well, that's silly. How's that going to cause salvation? Right. But it's not so much the details. And if you real, really sit down, and you listen to another person's description of why they believe something, the well thought out process, I think it gives you a little more respect. You understand that they have a reason that they believe this. It's not just some, these, you know, fanciful myths that they believe. There's right. actually a reason behind it. Maybe, maybe some of them are fanciful myths, but in some cases, I think you actually, this person has it well thought out. There's a reason behind this. And it makes it a little harder to just, you know, have a, a disparaging view and i think in the the grand scheme of things if you kind of everyone looks at it from that perspective there's reasons behind these that that makes a big difference i i love that and, and you know even if we consider ourselves spiritual or not but religious it's true what you say that there's this tendency sometimes to disparage the religious but you have to think about it if somebody wakes up every day and they said well my spirituality is just about being positive and that's great but if somebody takes communion regularly and that moment changes their mindset, that ritual turns on positivity in them, then that's their why. And so it doesn't matter if they're getting it in the halls of religion or without. Rituals from different traditions put people in a certain headspace. And that headspace can be a very powerful way of transforming lives personally and spiritually. So I think it's, I think it's very, very, very true what you say. So, Nathan, what's a tip or tool then, based on your research on Passover, Easter, and how it's transformed your life, what's a tip or tool you can give us, our listeners, to help us on our journeys of personal and spiritual growth? So one of the things that I would really recommend for people is don't just settle for things that seem good to you. I, I think there's kind of a, a more of a modern trend that we will look at all these different religions, these, these spiritualities, and a lot of times on the surface, our conclusions, our results end up saying like, well, this is, this seems good to me. Right. I like, I like what it says. I like the outcome. 
But I think a lot of time that's focusing on that very last layer, like the details or the what. Right. And I'd really encourage people of, of all different faith traditions to go back and look at the reasons behind those beliefs. Right. And a lot of times I'd almost, so if you've been, you know, within a religion for a while, you're looking at different ones or even just curious, I think one of the phrases I like to use is try to meet that religion for the first time again. Oh, interesting. That was how I viewed this book. There's the, the Passover. When I wrote it, I felt like it allowed me to go back to my religion almost from fresh eyes and kind of meet it again for the first time. And that, that changes things. I mean, a lot of times, depending on, you know, if you're 18 and you, you look, see a religion for the first time, you have a different perspective than maybe 30 years later after you've had, you know, family, kids, parents have died. You've had all these other things and your life has changed. You go back and you look at it again. I think that's very refreshing. I think that's fantastic. And it can lead to some really interesting conversations too. So in, instead of leaving behind everything that we were taught growing up, like you said, you revisit it and make the decision for yourself and decide if, if those really resonate with you. I think that's, that's fantastic advice, Nathan. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, and I, I do think that that's kind of when I finished the book, that was my conclusion. I even think I put that in there is at least from my perspective, I felt like going through this whole story again, it was like meeting Jesus again for the first time. Interesting. I mean, I went back through and said like, this is the same stuff I knew, the same details, but it was almost like meeting someone again for the first time and seeing all those details put together. And I think it's, that's not just specific to, you know, Christianity. I think you could do that with, with any, any religion. That's a very powerful message because I think sometimes people are trapped in the middle. They, they don't know what to do. You know, they have these traditions that they love, but then they feel a pull in another direction. And by revisiting your traditions, you might just find that some of the things in those traditions can fulfill spiritual and personal growth needs. And you never even knew it. I, I think that's, that's just fantastic advice. Fantastic. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the Nobody Guide to Life. Nathan, thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing your, your personal story. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks. And I want to remind our listeners, sometimes things that appear different are actually very closely related. Maybe they're part of the same story. If you take time to investigate, it doesn't matter if you celebrate Easter, Passover, or neither holiday. Today's lesson is about taking time to understand the deeper narratives that surround cherished traditions. Some of the practices you do in everyday life may even be closely related to practices your neighbors do, practices you never thought would have something in common. If today's talk has taught us anything, it's that maybe what appears distant is really closer and more connected than we think. You can find Nathan's book, Passover, the story of Easter from the beginning at Amazon or comethirstyministry.com. The links will be in our show notes. And you can always check out more episodes at the Nobody Guide to Life.com. Reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook at Nobody's View or on Instagram at J.A. Plosker or join our Facebook community, Simple Spirituality. If you liked what you heard on this episode, please consider sharing it with someone you know. Keep practicing and have a good week.